Thanks very much, uh, Jim, for that wonderful introduction. And I especially want to thank uh, Professor Tom McCall uh, for inviting me here, uh, Jeffrey Fulkerson for taking care of all the modalities, and my dear friend, Professor Jim Hoffmeyer, for having suggested to people here that I come and that I'd be invited. So that, without his uh, particular interest in this, I would not be here in our friendship, which I greatly value. I have learned an enormous amount about ancient Egypt from reading Jim's work and from knowing him as a person, and also many other things about what's happening in Egypt today through my, my connection with Jim as well. Uh, <clears throat> the title of this talk is about an undertold story. Now, how many of you are really following what's happening in Egypt? I imagine you have a great interest, so you would not be here, but are, are you really seriously trying to get a clear picture of what's going on over there, and do you find it difficult? Do you detect a particular bias? And would that bias happen to be A, that the Muslim Brotherhood is moderate, B, that uh, the secular liberals that were the heroes of the revolution just two years ago are now the enemy because they oppose the Muslim Brotherhood? who was never supposed to take power in the first place, because everyone was reassured that would never happen. <laughs> but don't worry about those people if they do, you know. So, well, all those things have happened. And that's all part of the story which I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, right now, Christians, and not only Christians, but all minorities, all non-Muslim minorities, and even some Muslim minorities are in danger from the Muslim majorities where they live all over the Middle East, and not just in the Middle East, in Nigeria, in Somalia, in Ethiopia, in Pakistan, and in India, in all sorts of places where there are uh, attempts by Muslims to either marginalize or destroy the, the Christian populations where, where they live amongst them. And this is a problem which is not getting a great deal of attention, as you noticed. <laughs> I think you all noticed it by now. In the media. And not only in the media, but in government and in academe. It is a serious problem. The lack of attention and the lack of willingness to face it frankly, to understand it, to see it in its real terms. It's one of the greatest problems, probably the, most great, probably the greatest existential problem of our time. It's a failure to understand what is happening. Uh, uh, what is happening between Islam and the rest of the world? What I'm going to talk to you about tonight is a small part of it, just a very small part of it, but very, very illustrative in a broader sense. In 2003, when the United States overthrew Saddam Hussein, in a war that was cast in the Middle East as a sort of crusader war, a war against Islam. And many of the people in the media here, and in Europe particularly, bought that line, that it was a new crusade, because George Bush was a fundamentalist Christian, et cetera, et cetera, which was anything but, actually, in many ways. Uh, Certainly not a literal believer in the Bible, as he later made very plain when he was asked about it. He, he launched a process that liberated many Muslims, Shiite Muslims, who had been oppressed by the Sunni Muslim minority in their country for the last 400 years. They were allowed to freely practice in ways they had not been able to under Saddam Hussein and under previous rulers in some ways. Uh, for, you know, the entire length of the Ottoman Empire in the, in the following you know, post-Ottoman period. And particularly under the extremely repressive rule of Saddam Hussein, who was from the Sunni minority. 
Yet, it was a crusader war. When President Mohammed Morsi was overthrown in Egypt by a Muslim, a Muslim majority population, 30 million or more perhaps came out in opposition to Mohammed Morsi on June 30th, 2013. After only one year in power, the Muslim Brotherhood blamed who? Who did they blame? The Christians. This was dealt with in the media as though it were simply an unimportant detail. And when President Obama criticized the new government of Egypt that had overthrown and replaced Morsi, it did so while casting a slight aside onto the issue of Christian persecution. It focused almost entirely on the repression of a sinister, aggressive, triumphalist, racist, misogynistic, anti-Western, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic organization bent on our destruction. And you would never know it from reading the newspaper. Since the, uh, since the Iraq war, and particularly since the presidency of, President, of, of Barack Obama, since it began in 2009, we have seen Hezbollah, a radical Shiite organization taking over Lebanon. It was protected by every other president from that eventuality, diplomatically, and in every other way, prior to this president. We have seen Iran make enormous progress towards a nuclear weapon, which is almost certainly going to have, it's almost certainly going to become a reality. I mean, it's very unlikely this the current negotiations will prevent it from having nuclear weapons. If they do, it will be because the Europeans, not the Americans, push them to reach the right terms. And the Israelis, above all, because they have the most to lose directly, they th even though all of us have the same to lose, ultimately, from Iran's nuclear weapons and their acquisition thereof. We have seen the United States in the Arab Spring back Islamist movements and focus its energy on assisting them and helping them rise to the top in popular uprisings against despotic rulers. Even replacing our own key allies with Islamists dedicated to destroying us and then giving them more money than they got under the previous regime. More, more weapons, more assistance, and more moral support than one would ever have imagined an American government would ever consider giving them. Yet, in Egypt, there has been a great victory, a limited but still great victory over the Islamists. And I define Islamists as those who seek to impose Sharia by whatever means are necessary. Many Muslims would be glad to live in a Sharia state, but would not push for it. It's quite popular in polls in Egypt, for example. And yet, when a regime came into power that sought to railroad through Sharia law, the majority of Egyptians resented it because of the style in which it was implemented, perhaps, and because it ruined the economy. Whatever their reasons, it was imperative for us to support them. But unfortunately, because of the built-in prejudice in all Muslim societies, against minorities, against non-Muslim minorities. Even that new government which is fighting tooth and nail with the Islamists today 
does not adequately protect the, Christ the Christians who are being attacked by those Islamists who scapegoat them, the Christians, for what's happened to them, to their own uh, malfeasance. We ignore what's really going on over there at our own peril because they're working here too. They're in our government. They're in our society. We, we grant them deference. We treat them as beyond criticism. They do not hesitate to criticize us. Let's focus again on Egypt, which is where, I'm, where I've lived for 20 years and where I feel, as my, I feel that as my second home. Egypt is my Sorry. Spiritual home of mine. Not because of a religion, but because of the nature of the people in Egypt. The Egyptians have something called al basata, which is uh, literally translated as simplicity. But it really means you accept people as they are. This was the baseline culture, which uh, was created in, in antiquity, probably, but which has gone through very many evolutions, even in my own lifetime. It's now, unfortunately, been warped in another direction. There's an attempt to correct it. But uh, Egypt is a land that produced, for example, the champion of Basata in, in personal dealings, and that is a man named Nigib Mahfouz, who Jim mentioned in, in reference to me in my introduction. Nagib Mahfouz was a writer born in the heart of Islamic Cairo in 1911. He lived to be 94, he died in 2006. Uh, when he was born, even though he was living in a very Islamic district, clearly, the place where the city of Cairo was formed by Shiite Fatimid rulers, in 969, long before the Sunni conquests of Egypt, uh, the return Sunni conquests of Egypt, actually. But long before the, the, the Fatimids were overthrown, this beautiful place uh, came to be the heart of a new civilization, in a sense. Cairo was a new, a new city that was based, based in an old location, a few miles north of an old location, the city of Babylon. Babylon, the gate to the temple of On, or of, to, of Yunu, in, uh, of Ra, in the Yunu, in Heliopolis. So, an extremely ancient culture, one that was too big for the kind of prejudice that we see today, too deep. Mahfouz's mother, was illiterate. She was a daughter of a sheikh from Al-Azhar. She would take him, though she didn't know anything about the texts behind, you know, the, the historical texts or, his, or history itself. She got to know this, the, the, the guides and the specialists and care of the monuments of, of both Islamic and Christian saints, the churches, the synagogues, ancient Egyptian temples, all these things were part of the Egyptian patrimony. And when Mahfouz was young, he was five years old, he visited these sites at his mother's side. And he said later that when he was a child, you couldn't tell who was a Christian or who was a Muslim until they died and you saw where the funeral was going to be held at a church or at a mosque. This was the golden age of Egyptian national unity. This was following the 1919 revolution in which Saad Zaglul led the uprising against British colonialism, the British occupation. And the greatest uprising seen before the one we saw in 2013 took place at that time. And its, its slogan was, Adil Lillah, 
Wal-watan al Religion is for God. The nation is for all. The Jewish community was strong and thriving. Nobody cared. A hundred years earlier, if you read Edward William Lane, the Jewish community was much more oppressed. But for a period, for a golden age of about a hundred years, maybe 50 years, there was a different census, a different sense. That lasted until, God knows, perhaps the 70s, through the revolution of 1952. And then into the period of Anwar Sadat, when the Muslim Brotherhood, which had been suppressed under Gamal Abdel Nasser, who took power in the pre-officer's coup in 1952, came back to fight the leftists to help Anwar Sadat maintain power. is undoubtedly his greatest mistake as a leader. Otherwise, he was a great leader in many ways. But that brings us to who is the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood was founded in 1928 in Ismailia by Hassan al-Banna, who had a dream to restore the caliphate abolished by Ataturk in 1924. He established his organization in the Salafi Library in Ismailia. The Salafis are a group, the name literally means to follow the ancestors, that want to return to the original Islam as they believe it was practiced. No one knows exactly how Islam was practiced in the beginning. In fact, there's even doubt as to how Islam really originated. If you read the most, the most recent book by Robert Spencer, for example, uh, Did Muhammad Exist? You might have uh, some insight into the arguments about that. But, This vision of reimposing a pure society has haunted the Middle East for much longer than the Islamic, than the, than the Muslim Brotherhood's existence. This is only the more modern manifestation, and it was a group that adopted modern methods of organization, of penetration of existing institutions, of preaching for change from the inside through infiltration of existing institutions. And the process called a dawa. The strategy is called a dawa, which means literally preaching, but it means much more than that in this context. It means spreading the word and spreading influence and subversion. By the 1940s, it no longer was content with just preaching or infiltrating. It was engaged in, in a, ongoing attacks on individuals, assassinations. It started, in many ways, Egypt's involvement in the war against the formation of Israel in 1948. It was a warrior society, which is precisely what any institution that or any group that tries to create an, a truly Islamic society has to be. It was spread by the sword. However, uh, forced by the repression that it met in the late 1940s after it assassinated the Prime Minister in Nakrashi Basha, and then the, the counter-assassination by the security services of El Banna himself, the founder, the organization gradually evolved its strategy. It chose to take power at first through an, a, a revolution hatched in the army, which is in cooperation with President Anwar Sadat, I mean with uh, he, he was involved, but uh, Gamal Ibn Nasser was leader of the Free Officers Movement in 52. And when that failed, that is their bid to take power failed because uh, Nasser only used them for his own purposes. Ultimately, uh, they were driven underground after they attempted to kill, or it seemed to have attempted to kill Nasser at uh, an incident in Manchia in Alexandria on October 26, 1954. This was a seminal moment in the organization. This is a moment that parallels to some extent what's happening today. Not quite the same. It's not quite the same, not, not an exact parallel. But it, there is a certain 
a certain similarity in that they were, they, I mean, Nasser himself had worked with them to come to power, just as the man who was over, who's overthrown Sisi, uh, Morsi, General Abdel Fattah Sisi, who I'll discuss more in a little while. Just as he worked with Morsi, he was an appointee of Morsi's. There was a collaboration at the beginning, but they had a different vision. Abdel Nasser was more of a secularist. He was more of a, uh, and a pan-Arabist as well. He did not believe so much in the, the overarching Islamic identity of Egypt, but in its Arab identity. He thought that it would have greater influence in the world if it became the champion and the, and the capital of the Arab world, of the Arabs altogether. And it created a pan-Arab ideology. I mean, it helped, it helped to, to foster it and to, and to make it extremely popular in the Arab world. Prior, prior to this movement, Egypt was not, it did not consider itself to be Arab. Pro-Arab sentiment in Egypt really established itself in the 1930s and 40s. Arab identity as a choice for Egyptians really began in the 30s and 40s. For a brief time before that, there was something that Mahfouz himself belonged to, which is the movement called Pharaonism, which sought to justify, or actually to explain Egypt's identity, to root it in its, the country's ancient past, so that it was closer in their view. And this is a view espoused by Taha Hussein, who was one of its architects and greatest exponents, to Hussein, a very great blind intellectual uh, who died in the 1970s, 1973, I think, who was uh, the greatest literateur of the modern age in Egypt before Mahfouz, and maybe greater than Mahfouz himself, in, in the sense of literature as opposed to the broader sense than, than fiction. He was uh, a champion of this movement which thought that Egypt was unique because it was the oldest civilization. It was the cradle of civilization. And it had more affinity with ancient Greece and Rome, the classical antiquity, because they were in Egypt. And they had influenced the culture. And also, Egypt itself had influenced their culture. But this was rejected uh, by, in, in large part, because there was a feeling that Egypt was therefore going to be drawn closer to the Western orbit. And it was in a conflict with colonialism. And also because of the pull of Islam. Islam is a much more, in, their, you know, in the sense of the popular culture, much more deep rooted in people's psyches than Pharaonism. People had ignored ancient Egypt until the Europeans came along and deciphered hieroglyphs in the 19th century, Chapoleon. There were some esoteric writings attempting to understand Egyptian monuments, ancient Egyptian monuments. And there's an interesting and very rich but limited literature in this field. But in, in essence, it, they were not seen as being relevant, these, these ancient monuments, to modern life or to Islamic life. And Christians, of course, looked at them as being, in a sense, just like Muslims did from the, before the revelation. So although ancient Egyptians were a source of pride for Christians as well, because their language, the Coptic language, derived from, it was the last phase, in fact, of the ancient Egyptian language. And ancient Egyptian music, which is the oldest Egyptian, the oldest musical tradition in the world, uh, which was saved from oblivion by a lone Coptic individual, scholar in the 1930s or 20s through, through the 1990s when he died at the age of 102. Raga Muftah. I worked with him a bit. This, uh, this was a very rich heritage which also was not so well known. No, Egypt was really more rooted in an Islamic identity and had lost to some degree its sense of nationhood but never completely. For example, you can see the conflicting trends in the 19th century and the 1882 uprising against the British that brought the British, or against the British and French 
control of the Egyptian monarchy through finance, which led to a rebellion by Egyptian army officers who also resented, they were native Egyptians, who resented the Turkish aristocracy from the Ottoman Empire in its dominance of Egyptian society and the army. So Ahmed Arabi rose up in 1882 with the Egyptian officers at his side, rallying people on his side against the Ottoman appointed Khedive, the local ruler who worked with the British and French, Tafik Pasha. And this movement resulted in a number of riots and massacres of Europeans living in Egypt, especially in Alexandria. And that resulted in a, a British military intervention that led to the occupation that lasted until 1956. So, during the uprising by Ahmed al-Rabi, many of the peasants refused to take part to help them against the British and the French. Because the Ottoman Emperor, the Ottoman Sultan actually, did not accept it because they were, he was you know, basically at peace with these powers and did not want to go enter conf into conflict with them. So he did not approve of uh, Arabi's rebellion. <coughs> So ultimately, the Egyptians there demonstrated this kind of schizophrenia, which, or dual nature, you might say, dual identity. It's even more than a dual identity because it's in some ways beyond Egyptian or Muslim, it is also African. So ultimately, these conflicts have not yet been resolved. And I want to go back to that in a bit. But Nagib Mahfouz was only one of the products of this, this Egyptian spirit I'm talking about. Another was Muhammad Atta, the man who led the 9-11 attacks. He, in fact, represents another another variation of the split. Nagib Mahfouz remained a pharaonist until he died. Muhammad Atta, who was involved with Islamic preservation projects in Cairo for some years, at least for a while before he went to study or finish his work in uh, Germany prior to going to America to blow up the World Trade Center. Uh, he was interested in the Islamic heritage. He was working in Islamic Cairo. And I know a German architect who was working with him, in fact. So, Egypt, of course, is very important to understand from this point of view because it is strategically so important to us. It's the largest Arab country, it sits on the Suez Canal. It was the first to rally the other parts of the Arab world against Israel and its creation in 1948, and it was the first country to sign a peace treaty with Israel. It's a major player in every level of the Islamic world in Africa and the Mediterranean region. Yet it's poor, it's, it's chronically poor, overpopulated. The population now is about 90 million. When I first visited Egypt in 1977, it was 45 million. And as I noted, it was the, the birthplace of the Pan-Arab movements and the birthplace of the Muslim Brotherhood, which created the majority, which it fostered the majority of the militant Islamist organizations that exist today, including Al-Qaeda. Ayman al-Zawahiri, the current leader of Al-Qaeda, was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Egypt, of course, is also the land, as we all know, of the pharaohs, where the Greeks, as tourists in the fifth century, invented Egyptomania, fifth century BC. The home of King Tut, Valley of the Kings and Queens, the memory of Cleopatra's Alexandria, and is also the place where Lawrence Durrell's Alexandria resides in our memory. 
the nation that elected the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis just, in, uh, just a year and a half ago, and then overthrew them in the biggest demonstrations ever seen in human history. So just imagine the tumult within, the currents, how deep they are within that country, and how difficult they are to understand, especially if you're reading what's going on in the media and listening to what's being said. My first visit to Egypt was in 1977 as a guest of Yusuf al-Sabai, who was then the editor of Al-Ahram newspaper, and uh, a man who was President Sadat's accountant. Uh, I was part of a student group. It was our group that was invited, not myself personally, a group of 10 students from Grand Valley State Colleges, now a university in West Michigan. We were treated as VIPs because we were the first group to come there in any sort of a capacity, sponsored by both governments or by their government and our institution in, in Grand Valley uh, since 1973, in the war of 1973. So it was a big deal for them. But we were just a bunch of you know, raggedy students, <laughs> long-haired, unkempt, and everything else. While we were there, our high-level hosts told us that there was a secret war going on against Christians in Upper Egypt mainly, in the southern part of the country. They were being assassinated. Policemen as well, who were always identified in these, in these uh, struggles by the Islamists as protectors of the Christians, though they don't really protect them very well, which we'll also return to. Uh, they were being stabbed to death quietly at, you know, when they stopped in traffic, even in Cairo. So, and none of this was in the newspapers. So already we had a problem in 1977, getting the story out. There was so much ferment of this nature in Egypt that I and all my, uh, you know, uh, hubris at the time when I was asked to speak at a church in the, in the Grand Rapids area after my trip there, uh, I said, I thought there could be an Islamic revolution in Egypt. That was about a year before the 1979 revolution in, in Iran, which of course was the great impetus, which provided the great impetus for so much of what's happened since because it was an, a, a model of what can happen what, what Islamists can achieve when they set out to do it, and when they dupe the West into helping them. You may remember that Jimmy Carter basically viewed Ga uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini at the beginning as a sort of Islamic Gandhi. <laughs> there was a, a view, a very benign view of the, Islamist revo of the Islamic revolution, uh, because it was against this despotic Shah, our ally, sort of our colonial guilt was projected onto this. And Ayatollah Khomeini pretended to be a moderate. He just kept silent. He didn't even say much. He knew enough not to speak. But after a year, students who were loyal to him seized our embassy hostages. And he had pretty much everyone, all the liberals in this country that had helped him, secular liberals and the communists who had been duped into helping him as well, executed or forced into exile. And for years and years afterwards, they were still being killed or, and persecuted, as they are today. In terms of Egypt's history with the Christians, Egypt is, of course, the home of the oldest Christian community, the Copts, who hold the Monophysite doctrine. And they <laughs> suffered enormous persecution under the Romans. Then they were occupied by the Byzantines after some brief independence. Then, when the Muslims came in 641, under Amr ibn al-As, uh, 
there a, a great myth developed inside Egypt, which is actually probably a more modern invention, that they were welcomed as conquerors, that is the Islamic armies were viewed as people who would, were lifting the Byzantine yoke from the Egyptians. And it is true there was a bit of more liberal rule around Fustat in the area where they first established their capital, but it was not really that way for in many, for, there's a man named Tom Power who's done some really interesting research uh, uh, showing that much of the, uh, the early rule of Islam was quite brutal, and particularly very chaotic, a lot of booty seeking. Uh, Butler, A.J. Butler, who was the great historian of this period of the Islamic conquest, uh, documented that the resistance continued in the Delta for quite a long time. And, Israel, and Alexandria, the capital, had to be reconquered after the first time after it was first surrendered by uh, Cyrus the uh, El Mokhokas, the Caucasian. It was called as he came from the Caucasus. He was the Byzantine Melkite patriarch, who was despised by many of the cops because they thought he had sold out the country to the Muslims for a bribe. But nowadays, you cannot say that in public discourse, really, in Egypt, because it's viewed as a contrary to the national myth. So you have this element of the history. Egypt remained mainly Christian in population until about the 14th century when it was subject to a brutal wave of forced conversions and riots. Uh, of course, many did convert voluntarily, sometimes for personal advantage, because the taxation system against non-Muslims, the jizya tax, encouraged that. You were offered a choice under Islam of the sword, or paying the jizya tax, or nothing. <laughs> so, uh, so there was this this element as well in the history. People have buried, and it also you have uh, the creation of the Islamic madrasa. You've heard a lot about madrasas in the context of Pakistan, for example, and spreading in militancy. Well, the first anti-Christian madrasas were probably developed in Egypt uh, in the 12th century under the great enlightened sultan, or actually he was the vizier at the time, uh, Salah al-Din al -Ayubi, who was working under the Fatimids. But he, he, he was primarily interested in not fighting the Shiite regime, which he was establishing Sunni madrasas in, in, in a Shiite country, it seems he was really more interested, or at least his allies were more interested in stopping the Christians, who were still a threat because they were such a large part of the population. And they, in fact, he, he forced them out of the civil service because they had depended upon Christians to run the civil service until that time. So there was a there are a great many myths about the, the, the relationship between these communities, which have persisted to this day. So political correctness is not new, necessarily, in every sense. Going back to Naguib Mahfouz, by the way, in the, in the uh, 1930s, he graduated from what was then called the Egyptian University, now Cairo University, in 1934. He was third in his class. This is the man who said you couldn't tell who was a Christian or a Muslim until they went to their funeral. Uh, he was going to be sent to Europe as uh, the sort of the, the rite of passage. You, you, you were entitled to a scholarship to go study in Europe. You were at that time. If you scored very well, and you, you know, and you, if you placed very highly in your graduating class, and he certainly was entitled to a scholarship, but he was passed over because he had a name that was exactly the same as a very famous Coptic physician named Naguib Mahfouz. In fact, Naguib Mahfouz, the writer, that's not really his whole name. That's a compound first name. He was named Naguib Mahfouz in honor of the doctor who delivered him. He was an obstetrician, who later became a pasha under King Farouk. And 
which is quite a, uh, that was during more, one of the more liberal periods of Egyptian history when a Christian could rise that high. But he was singled out by the head of the committee to not get a scholarship. He was denied one because they thought he was a, a Christian. But in fact, he's Muslim. And uh, when, he, when he showed them his full name, it was too late. Bigi Mahfouz Abdulaziz, Ibrahim Ahmed. That name would have told them he's a Muslim. So even in the, in the most liberal period for Christian-Muslim relations, you had issues like this. As I'm not saying it was entirely negative, it was not, not all oppression. It was certainly much more liberal than it is, or it certainly was under Morsi, and it, and it is today. Today, a, a Christian cannot become a pasha, or the, or the equivalent thereof in contemporary society. They cannot rise very high. The highest under Mubarak was a minister of state, you know, who was the, for foreign affairs, uh, Butrus Khali. But the last uh, Coptic prime minister was assassinated. Uh, actually, the last one was nearly assassinated. The first one before him was assassinated. Yusuf Wali was nearly assassinated in 1919. And the one before him was Butrus Ghali, the elder, who was assassinated by a Muslim. So uh, this is the kind of issue that we don't see much of. We don't see this much discussion of it today. Yet it's a living thing in Egypt. It's a living thing in many Muslim societies. So what's happened in the last three years that, this, that might be different? We, ha we saw the overthrow of a leader who was friendly to the United States and who was pretty moderate when it comes to interfaith relations. Christians did not have it very wonderfully well under Mubarak. But, and in fact, there, was, there are many incidents that were extremely troubling under Mubarak, where, uh, violence against Christians and the lack of protection for Christians in these incidents. And his era basically ended with an explosion in a church in Alexandria. Less than a, that was on New Year's Day, 19, or 2011. 25 days later, the revolution against Mubarak began. And in one of the great features that the media played upon in, this, in these demonstrations in Tahrir Square and elsewhere was that Christians and Muslims defended each other. Well, unfortunately, that was only part of the story. During that whole process, there were also attacks on churches outside of Cairo. Uh, the security apparatus failed to protect people when they were attacked in churches and, and, or just otherwise performing their lives, living their lives as Christians, as members of the minority. <clears throat> and also, we had this change in the government at the encouragement of the United States, Mubarak had been our close ally for 30 years. He was not a perfect ally. He spread a lot of hate against us as well. He thought as a way of buying legitimacy because the elite itself would have also stirred that same hate. And he did not want it seem to be contradicting them. That is the cultural elite that grew up under Nasser, which was very anti-Western. So we sought to capitalize and to, to co-opt them, capitalize on their, you know, their, their, uh, their hatred in the sense that he would, he would buy popularity with it by sharing it in public on one level while cooperating with us internationally on another. And in fact, I saw firsthand how very close the security cooperation was between the Israelis and the Egyptians under Mubarak. And the security people on both sides were actually quite friendly with each other and would view each other as friends. I saw them hanging out together and being quite close to each other as friends. So a spirit of camaraderie existed. But on another level, on the public level, it was the exact opposite. It was all hatred and anathema. So how did this happen? How did President Mubarak disappear? What did he do? made us 
our government wanted him to disappear. But he didn't do anything different. It was us who changed. It was our government that changed. On June 4th, 2009, President Obama went to Cairo to give his great outreach address to the Islamic world. And what did he say? What did he do? Not more than what he said is important. What did he do when he set this up? He invited the Muslim Brotherhood to join, to, to attend. He put them in the front row. And by doing so, this is an illegal revolutionary organization that had been trying to overthrow the government of Egypt since its inception in 1928, even though it was pretending not to be a revolutionary organization at the time, everybody knew its real nature and its real ambitions. And that's why we never had any official dealings on, a, on such a level with them under previous presidents. But our president in 2009 essentially turned all that upside down, put it on, turned it on its head, and invited this, this, these leaders to the exclusion of President Mubarak, who was our official host and our ally, our, government, our president's official host and ally, and even called him his friend. But he couldn't possibly attend under those circumstances. What President Obama did by doing this, and if he said nothing else, the message would have still gotten through. He said implicitly to them, you are the future. Because they were the only viable movements as the, our, our government was fond of pointing out at the time of the revolution, just two years later, the only viable opposition movement, the only one that was strong enough, big enough, well organized enough to actually mount an opposition to Mubarak. But the one that Mubarak could not destroy, it was too deeply rooted, because it was so resonant with Egyptian identity, his Islamic identity, so well organized and so well funded from outside by the Saudis and other people, Saudi institutions, if not the Saudi government. So, and other Muslims. And even had cooperated to some degree with the CIA in earlier periods, in the 70s, for example. But this is, a new, it was taken to a far higher level of cooperation. It was an outright blessing. And it was systematically denied in the media. It was systematically poo-pooed. Of course, we were, we're not favoring any particular group, they would say, in the administration. But in the outreach to the Islamic world, as a concept, was a flawed idea because we never have had a relationship diplomatically with an entity called the Islamic world. It doesn't exist. There are countries which are majority Muslim, and we've always had relations with those states. Can you imagine if we, if we sent a president, our president somewhere to speak to the Christian world? what people would say, to the Buddhist world, to the Hindu world? Would anyone think that made any sense? But because we have been involved militarily in some Islamic countries, we're not fighting the, the Muslims per se, we're fighting a specific enemy within the Islamic world. That's been our identified foe in this war, the war on terror. And we were attacked by that foe. And we're only responding to that attack. And actually a series of attacks, the embassy bombings in 1998 in Africa, as well as 9-11, as well as a host of other small things that people have forgotten, as well as the hostage crisis in Iran, et cetera, et cetera. So our government decided in 2009 beginning in the, at that point, I think, with the speech to the Islamic world. Not to, not to change the Islamic world's view of us, whatever that might be. In fact, it's diverse. It's not one thing. We began to change ourselves. Our country was no longer interested in the rights of the individual, but in the rights of a community and its global rights, not even its rights within the United States. And that changed our foreign policy in a way which is we've not yet even begun to think about 
on a, on a, on a massive scale, as it deserves. In fact, we're blindly sleepwalking into more and more errors of the same kind. Our government is trying to reverse the revolution in Egypt, even though it's it allegedly made an accommodation with it because they can't change it overnight. But they're trying to persuade them to bring in Morsi and to bring in all the others in the Muslim Brotherhood, to bring them back into the process and to allow them the same rights that they might be able to manipulate, at least in their minds they hope to, and maybe in the long run they will be able to, in such a way as to regain power or regain a position of influence that will allow them eventually to gain power again. It cannot happen probably in this generation with such, a, such hatred of them now by the majority of Egyptians. And that's another astounding thing, that the purpose of the speech in 2009 was to improve our image in this Islamic world. It had the opposite effect. The policies that it led to have had the opposite effect. Rather than condemning us for adventurism, we're condemned, you know, as people said, we, we, were, we were guilty of adventurism under Bush. We're now condemned for our timidity and for supporting the enemies of democracy. Bush was criticized for trying to impose democracy. Which would you rather have, if either? Even in Iraq, President Obama, unfortunately, has reversed the progress that was made at the end by the surge, which he, which he opposed, that, created, uh, that corrected many of the problems of the early phases of the war after the war in Iraq by rushing through the withdrawal, by not having, leaving an adequate status of forces agreement that would keep us in a, in a position to prevent the reintroduction of Al-Qaeda's forces to the, to the country. We surrendered the country to Iran's influence by backing the pro-Iranian candidate in the last elections in Iran. Uh, al-Maliki instead of Ayat al -Alawi. We in fact helped put back uh, put a Shiite fundamentalist government in power. And now it has driven the Sunnis who had cooperated with us during the last phases of the surge and finally put the place back in some order and, and given it a chance to have a meaningful democracy in the future perhaps. Certainly not immediately but in the future perhaps. It's reversed all that by picking a sectarian over a secularist. The same choice that's being made in Egypt and being made now in Syria. It was made in Tunisia when they backed in Nahda. Made in Libya when they chose to overthrow a man who was cooperating with us in the war on terror, as bad as he was at home. He was not an enemy of the United States, Muammar Gaddafi, at the time he was overthrown. He wasn't even as big a butcher as the man in Syria that's been killing all, this, all these people in the last two, three years, two and a half years. He was someone that we could have probably accommodated ourselves to for the future without serious damage to our national interests and perhaps it, to some benefit to our national interests. It was, it was a beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship at the time he disappeared. Instead, we replaced him with Islamist militias. Now, and look what happened in Benghazi as a result of that. Let's look again for a moment at, at General Abdel Fattah Sisi. Here is the possible hope and the possible uh, peril combined that faces us today in Egypt, even if we decide to support him, even if our government comes around and does what it should do, as the evidence would suggest right now. In the short term, he acted as what? An Islamist or as an Egyptian? A nationalist. He was a person who grew up in a religious family in Gamaliya, the same place where Naguib Mahfouz was born, in the heart of Islamic Cairo. However, 
when he grew up, he became uh, also a nationalist. The army itself is a culture of, has a culture of nationalism. So as he rose in the ranks, he absorbed that as well as the native patriotism of all Egyptians. He became also a political Islamist to a degree. He wrote a thesis or a sort of mini thesis at the uh, US Army War College in uh, 2006, where he spent a year, in which he called for an Islamic democracy. Very similar to what the Muslim Brotherhood would be saying. And he called for the return of the caliphate, which was the, the unifying government of the Arab world that followed Muhammad, but which has disappeared in antiquity. So, I mean, the original pure one, as they like to refer to it. This, this dream, he thought, was only for extremists to, propose, to push for it today. When he saw Morsi, the man who made him the Minister of Defense and head of the armed forces, cooperating with terrorists in Sinai, freeing terrorists from prison, including Al-Qaeda terrorists, even promising to give parts of uh, the area along the border with Sudan to the Islamist government of Sudan. His nationalism trumped his Islamism. He behaved, in a sense, the way that the ancient Egyptian ruler Horemheb behaved. Have you all heard of, all heard of Akhenaten? the founder of monotheism. <laughs> the first ruler who, who apparently professed to believe in only one god. That was in the, the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt. About uh, 1335, 1336. Was it, he, 1323 was when he died, I believe. Uh, yeah. 1353. 1353, okay. So he, he I think that more, it was more like uh, when Horemheb rose in 1323. Anyway, so uh, the, the point is, he, this is a religious fanatic who imposed a new system on Egypt. Egypt had a traditional pantheon of gods, and the chief god of Thebes, where the government was located, was Amun-Ra. And he destroyed the economy of the country by destroying the temple foundations of Amun-Ra and basically cause, allowing the country to sink into neglect because he was for, focused on solar gazing rather than or sort of worse than naval gazing, <laughs> rather than running the country properly. He allowed the eastern empire of the country to fall apart. Hormheb being his military commander, objected to all this. And when he had, saw his chance after the death of uh, the last royal claimant, Tutankhamun, and then when he was succeeded by his aged counselor I, ruled for about three years, and then he was gone. Horemheb seized power and made himself pharaoh and restored the Eastern Empire, the Northeastern provinces of the Egyptian Empire, and so the, the protectorates. And he restored what's called Mat, which is justice, truth, the cosmic order, which was all bound up in the well-being of Egypt and the ancient Egyptian conception. This was, this was his mission, and he pretty much achieved it. And he was followed by the line of Ramses, which lasted for about 100 years or so, and was much more stable at the beginning than, than anything that preceded it under Akhenaten and his immediate successors. So there was a, a sort of restoration. This is a bit parallel to what's happened in Egypt. The question is we don't know where it's going to go. You don't know if a Sisi's system will survive, if he himself is an Islamist ultimately. Will he restore Islamism when he thinks the country is economically restored? Or will he re retain something like what Mubarak was, uh, had fostered, which is a kind of semi-secular system? Or will he even go beyond that and allow the liberals and the intellectuals to create a new society with his backing, attempt to create one? We're watching, but we need to be sure that we don't try to return Egypt to where it was because it can only be much worse if it even goes back a half a step. As soon as Morsi was removed, he didn't attack the army as effectively as he attacked the minorities in Egypt, especially the Christians. 
He even attacked Shiites while they were in, while he was in power, at least his allies did. So it is up to us as Americans, whether we're Christian or not, to do our best to prevent the return of Islamists. The Islamist threat is global, and Egypt was on the front line. We should be helping them fight them and encouraging them to go beyond that fight to try to nurture and protect much more equitably the Christian minority. And our government should speak about that minority and to speak about the anti-Semitism that's also being fostered by the Islamists and even by the secular elite to a great extent. We need to fight that because it's coming our way. It's not going to stay there. It's global. And tomorrow it could be us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll have, uh...